but before him were the Vikings too, and I've heard one Gavin Menzies say that the Chinese sailed over America's way. Hello and welcome back to History Obscura podcast. You may recall the story I shared previously, maybe two years ago, of Christopher Columbus's voyage west in search of a circumnavigable route to India and China. Yes, the one in which he enthusiastically called the people he met Indians and renamed all their islands into the Spanish language. As well, if you've been listening to my sporadic chapters of The Utmost Island by Henry Myers, you'll know that the fascinating story of Leif Erikson and his crew, who fled Iceland to the warm summer shores of Vinland. The World Heritage Site, called Lance o Meadows, that translates to the Grassland Bay, is situated at the northern tip of the island part of Newfoundland and Labrador, and encompasses eight wood-framed buildings covered in rich green sod. Recent tree ring analysis has dated the site to 1021. Lance O. Meadows is the only undisputed site of pre-Columbian European occupation of any part of the Americas. And may I say that if you'd like to keep up with Leif Erikson's story in the Atmost Island, I've begun a separate stream where new chapters will be uploaded weekly. You can find it on Spotify and wherever you are listening to this podcast. It's titled Historical Fiction Book Club. The Utmost Island is one of my all-time favorite books, which is why I decided to share it with all of you. The author used the actual Norse sagas to construct his story, making it as true to life as possible, while also colorful, vibrant, and full of potent imagery. Again, the whole book is being released on Historical Fiction Book Club via your podcast player. So, what happened in the Americas before the Vikings stepped foot there? Well, the very first people are believed to have migrated there from Northwest Asia about 10,000 or 15,000, or even longer ago. These would have been small bands of Stone Age hunters who walked across a land bridge, or perhaps an ice bridge, between eastern Siberia and western Alaska, eventually making their way down an ice-free inland corridor into the heart of North America. Chasing steppe bison, woolly mammoths, and other large mammals, these ancestors of today's Native Americans established a thriving culture that eventually spread across two continents to the tip of South America. A subsequent theory, known as the Kelp Highway, posits that the first humans arrived on the continent not only by foot but by boat, traveling down the Pacific shore and subsisting on abundant coastal resources. Now our understanding of when people reached the Americas, and where they came from, is expanding dramatically. The emerging picture suggests that humans may have arrived in North America at least 20,000 years ago. New research raises the possibility of an intermediate settlement of hundreds or thousands of people who spread out over the wild land stretching between North America and Asia. The heart of that territory has long since been submerged by the Pacific Ocean, forming the present-day Bering Strait. But some 25 or 15,000 years ago, the strait itself and a continent-sized expanse flanking it were high and dry. That vanished world is called Beringia, and the developing theory about its pivotal role in populating North America is known as the Beringian Standstill Hypothesis. Standstill because generations of people migrating from the east might have settled there before moving on to North America. Much of this new theorizing is driven not by archaeologists wielding shovels, but by evolutionary geneticists taking DNA samples from some of the oldest human remains in the Americas, and from even older ones in Asia. 
Those discoveries have opened a wide gap between what the genetics seem to be saying and what the archaeology actually shows. Skeptical archaeologists say they will not believe this grand idea until they hold the relevant artifacts in their hands, pointing out that no confirmed North American archaeological sites older than 15 or 16,000 years currently exist. Other archaeologists, including this archaeologist in training, are confident, however, that it is only a matter of time until older sites produce artifacts that match the DNA results. In 2016 and 2017, a Hakai Institute team, led by archaeologist Duncan McLaren, excavated a site on Trickett Island containing obsidian cutting tools, fish hooks, a wooden implement used to start friction fires, and charcoal, dating from 13,000 to 14,000 years ago. On nearby Calvert Island, they found 29 footprints belonging to two adults and one child, stamped into a layer of clay-rich soil buried under the sand in an interdicial zone. Wood found in the footprints dated back roughly 13,000 years. Other scientists are conducting similar searches. Lauren Davis, for example, an archaeologist at Oregon State University, has crews from San Diego to Oregon using imaging and sediment cores to identify possible settlement sites drowned by rising seas, such as ancient estuaries. Davis's work inland led to his discovery of a settlement dating back more than 15,000 years at Cooper's Ferry, Idaho. That find, announced in August of 2019, meshes nicely with the theory of an early coastal migration into North America. Located on the Salmon River, which connects the Pacific via the Snake and Columbia Rivers, the Cooper's Ferry site is hundreds of miles from the coast. The settlement is at least 500 years older than the site that had long been viewed as the oldest confirmed archaeological site in the Americas, that is at Swan Point, Alaska. Said Davis, Early peoples moving south along the Pacific coast would have encountered the Columbia River as the first place below the glaciers where they could easily walk and paddle into North America. Essentially, the Columbia River corridor was the first off-ramp of a Pacific coast migration route. Eski Willerslev who directs the Center for Geogenetics at the Globe Institute at the University of Copenhagen and holds the Prince Philip Chair of Ecology and Evolution at the University of Cambridge, sequenced the first ancient human genome in 2010. He has since sequenced numerous genomes in an effort to piece together a picture of the first Americans, including a 12,400-year-old boy from Montana, an 11,500-year-old infant at Alaska's Upward Sun River site, and the skeletal DNA of a boy whose 24,000-year-old remains were found at a village of Malta near Russia's Lake Baikal. According to Willerslev, sophisticated genomic analyses of ancient human remains, which can determine when populations merged, split, or were isolated, show that the forebears of Native Americans became isolated from other Asian groups around 23,000 years ago. After that period of genetic separation, the most parsimonious explanation is that the first Americans migrated into Alaska well before 15,000 years ago, and possibly more than 20,000. Willerslev has concluded that there was a long period of gene flow between the Upward Sun River people and other Beringians from 23,000 to 20,000 years ago. Proponents of the Beringian standstill hypothesis also point to a cluster of remarkable archaeological sites on Siberia's Yana River, located on the western edge of Beringia, 1,200 miles from what is now the Bering Strait. Situated well above the Arctic Circle, the Yana sites were discovered in 2001 by Vladimir Putuko, an archaeologist with the Institute for the History of Material Culture in St. Petersburg. 
Over nearly two decades, Putulco and his team uncovered evidence of a thriving settlement dating back 32,000 years, including tools, weapons, intricate beadwork, pendants, mammoth ivory bowls, and carved human likenesses. Based on butchered animal skeletons and other evidence, Yana appears to have been occupied year-round by up to 500 people from 32,000 to 27,000 years ago, and sporadically inhabited until 17,000 years ago. Yet the ones who made it across the Bering Land Bridge were apparently not the people of Yana. Willerslev's lab extracted genetic information from the baby teeth of two boys who lived at the site more than 31,000 years ago and found that they shared only 20% of their DNA with the founding Native American population. Willerslev believes Yana's inhabitants were likely replaced by and interbred with the Paleo-Siberians who did eventually migrate into North America. Once in the New World, the first Americans, probably numbering in the hundreds or low thousands, traveled south of the ice sheets and split into two groups, a northern and southern branch. The northern branch populated what are now Alaska and Canada, while members of the southern branch exploded down North America, Central America, and South America with incredible speed. Such a movement could account for the growing number of archaeological sites dating from 14,000 to 15,000 years ago in Oregon, Wisconsin, Texas, and Florida. Far to the south, at Monte Verde in southern Chile, Conclusive evidence of human settlement dates back at least 14 and a half thousand years. Genetically, this expanded hypothesis makes sense, especially since the DNA profiles of people now living in South and Central America contained many of the same markers as those of Northern Native Americans, and both contain similar structures to the ancient Paleo-Siberians, a Polynesian link has also been suggested based on skeletal similarities in ancient South American sites. As one author succinctly states, there is no such thing as Mexican DNA. These are the American migration theories most well supported throughout the international academic community. But here's a fabulous one that is not. A Welsh poem of the 15th century tells how Prince Madoc sailed away in ten ships and discovered America. The account of the discovery of America by a Welsh prince, whether truth or myth, was apparently used by Queen Elizabeth I as evidence to the British claim to America during its territorial struggles with Spain. So who was this Welsh prince and did he really discover America? Owain Gwynedd, king of Gwynedd in the 12th century, had 19 children, six of whom were legitimate. Madoc, one of the illegitimate sons, was born in a castle in the Letter Valley. On the night of the death of the king in December 1169, the brothers fought amongst themselves the right to rule Gwynedd. And Madoc, Although brave and adventurous, was also a man of peace. So in 1170, he and his brother, Ririd, sailed from Abercarrick Gwynan on the North Wales coast in two ships. They sailed west and are said to have landed in what is now Alabama. Prince Maddock then returned to Wales with great tales of his adventures and persuaded others to return to America with him. They did, sailing from Lundy Island in 1171. However, this ship was never heard from again. It was, however, believed to have landed at Mobile Bay, Alabama, then traveling up the Alabama River, along which there are several stone forts, said by the local Cherokee tribes to have been constructed by white people. These structures have been dated to several hundred years before the arrival of Columbus and are said to be of a similar design to a castle in North Wales. Early explorers and pioneers found evidence of possible Welsh influence 
among the native tribes of America along the Tennessee and Missouri rivers. In the 18th century, one local tribe was discovered that seemed different to all the others that had been encountered before. Called the Mandans, this tribe was described as white men with forts, towns, and permanent villages laid out in streets and squares. They claimed ancestry with the Welsh and spoke a language remarkably similar to it. Instead of canoes, the Mandans fished from coracles, an ancient type of boat still found in Wales today. It was also observed that, unlike members of other tribes, these people grew white-haired with age. In addition, 1799 Governor John Sevier of Tennessee wrote a report in which he mentioned the discovery of six skeletons encased in brass armor bearing the Welsh coat of arms. George Catlin, a 19th century painter who spent eight years living among various Native American tribes, including the Mandans, declared that he had uncovered the descendants of Prince Maddox's expedition. He speculated that the Welshmen had lived among the Mandans for generations, intermarrying until their two cultures became virtually indistinguishable. Some later investigators supported his theory, noting that the Welsh and Mandan languages were so similar that the Mandans easily responded when spoken to in Welsh. Unfortunately, the tribe was virtually wiped out by a smallpox epidemic introduced by traders in 1837. But the belief in their Welsh heritage persisted well into the 20th century when a plaque was placed alongside Mobile Bay in 1953 by the Daughters of the American Revolution. In memory of Prince Maddock, the inscription reads, a Welsh explorer who landed on the shores of Mobile Bay in 1170 and left behind, with the Indians, the Welsh language. Thank you very much for listening. Don't forget to check out Historical Fiction Book Club and subscribe because I plan to upload many, many books that I hope you will enjoy. And don't forget to check out The Dietman Files wherever you find podcasts. Good night. Thank you.